Chapter 16 Get out! I shrieked, pulling out of his arms. I screeched to a halt in a shady side high parking lot. Now I jumped out into the rain and opened the back seat door. I mean it, I yelled. All right, all right, don't have a heart attack, he said. He crossed his arms and smiled up at me. The unspoken message was, if you want me out, you'll have to throw me out. That was exactly what I felt like doing. I was rapidly losing control. Lucas, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I want you out of my car now. If you don't get out, I'm going to start screaming at the top of my lungs. I'm going to turn you into the principal and to the police. I'm going to get you in every kind of trouble I know how. Now how's that for calm? Lucas flashed what he thought was a sexy smile. You're cute when you're angry. Out! He started to get out of the car, but very slowly. I yanked on his arm, but he seemed to enjoy playing tug-of-war, so I stopped. There, he said, I'm out. Now, what did you have in mind? I slammed the door behind him. Then I hopped back in the driver's seat and pulled away before I had even closed my door. I caught a glimpse of the expression on his face in my rearview mirror. His smile had finally faded. He looked upset. I drove fast, all the way home. Too fast. I didn't want to get a ticket, but I needed to put as many miles between me and Lucas as I could. I pulled into our driveway. Funny, the porch light wasn't on. My mom almost always left it on for me, and my dad's blue Subaru wasn't parked out front. Must be in the garage, I told myself. The rain had finally stopped, and the moon came out from behind a bank of clouds. I was glad for any light right then. I bent over and grasped the garage door handle. I yanked. It rumbled thunderously as it rose up over my head. The garage was empty. My parents were out. Unbelievable. If there is one night I didn't want to come home to an empty house, this was it. The door from the garage into the kitchen was locked. I fumbled for my key. I didn't have it on me. Only the front door key. Then I heard what sounded like footsteps in the house. My heart froze. I listened. Nothing. It must have been my imagination. Standing as straight as I could, I turned and made my way out of the garage. I put my hand down on something furry and jumped. The old carpet my dad had piled on top of the boxes of junk he had stored out there, I saw. The moon lit the walk to the front door. But the shrubs my father was so proud of, the ones that lined the walk, in the dark they loomed like huge monsters, ready to pounce. Get a grip on it, Lizzie, I warned myself. I had to try twice to put my key in the front lock because my hand was shaking so much. I got the door open and immediately locked it behind me. I flicked on the hall light, and every other light I passed by. The house was empty. I breathed a deep sigh and another. I looked on the hall table. No letter from Kevin. I hadn't answered his last letter. Still, I resented his not having written. Where was he when I needed him? Chocolate. That was the next best thing I could think of. I headed for the kitchen and my mom's secret stash in the vegetable crisper. The kitchen light was already on. Sitting at the kitchen table was Justin. Surprise, he said. Justin, how did you get in? I suddenly felt terrified. He had the strangest grin on his face. Your parents let me in. How do you think I got in? Where are my parents? I asked, not moving from the doorway. They went to pick up your aunt at the airport. My aunt? My first thought was that he was lying. My second that I should run out of the house, screaming my head off. Then I remembered this was Thursday. Aunt Reno was flying in from Dallas. I had totally forgotten about her. Sorry, I said with a sigh. I I've had a very tough day. It's been a tough time for all of us, Justin said soothingly. I nodded my head. Understatement of the year award goes to Justin Stiles. I opened the fridge and stared inside. I took out a ring ding. Want one? He gestured at the plate in front of him and grinned. From the crumbs, I could see that he had polished off the last of Mom's carrot cake. His grin spread. His perfect blue eyes were twinkling. He was so handsome. As scared as I was feeling, I couldn't help noticing that. Justin had what Alana called whip appeal. His looks zapped you, like someone had just flicked you with a whip. Listen, he said, the reason I came by. You mean you didn't just come by for my mom's carrot cake? She'll be hurt. I was starting to feel a little better. I sat down across from him. The reason I came by, he started again, is about Suki. I waited, puzzled. I wanted to ask you not to say anything. About what? About the fact that I was with her at the movies that night. I thought about this for a moment. What do you care? I asked him, once I had swallowed a mouthful of ring ding. The thing is, I don't want to go out with her again, he explained, and I don't want it to get around that I went out with her and dropped her. She's got a bad enough rap as it is. I rolled my eyes. I didn't believe him. 
but Justin was giving me the puppy dog expression of his. You know, it's been pretty lonely without Simone around, he said. Lonely? That didn't seem like the right word when her girlfriend had just been murdered. Justin got to his feet. He moved around the kitchen, glanced out the window, then came back and stood behind me. I scooted my chair to the side so I could look up at him. Yes, lonely, he said. It hurts so much with Simone gone. Justin reached out and gently cupped my cheek. Then he moved his hand and rubbed my neck. I pulled my head back and studied him warily. Come on, Lizzie, he said softly. You're interested in me, I can tell. I snorted. He looked stunned. Sorry, I said. But I swear, you're the biggest egomaniac in the history of Shadyside. What makes you think I'm interested in you? Justin's eyes widened. His mouth went slack. Well, if you're not, you're the first girl I've met around here who isn't. I got out of my chair and moved away from him. I guess you're not used to being rejected, are you? As a matter of fact, Justin's back arched a little. No. No, I agreed. No one rejected you even when you were going steady with Simone. What's that supposed to mean? What do you think that means? It means you were going out with Simone's friends behind her back. That's a lie. I felt a surge of anger. Don't call me a liar, Justin. You're the liar. You went out with Dawn. You went out with Rachel. And with Alana. And those are only the ones I know about. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. There is a new look in those blue eyes now. Fear. You were with Alana the same day Simone was killed, I went on. You already told the cops that part. Or did you forget? So what, Justin said. That doesn't make me a murderer. I held my breath. I never said anything about your being a murderer, I said finally. Well, then, what are you getting at? He seemed totally flustered now. Just that it was a pretty crummy thing to do to Simone, I continued. Well, I don't want to talk about that right now, he said, his eyes flashing. And if I were you, I wouldn't talk about it either. He spun on his heels and walked out. That was a threat. I had just been threatened. What would he do if I didn't keep my mouth shut, I wondered. As if in answer, the front door slammed shut. The five prom queen candidates, even Simone and Rachel, were all parading on stage in their gorgeous prom dresses. All the dresses were identical. They were all bright red. All the girls stopped with their backs to the audience. Mr. Seawall, the principal, was standing at the microphone, holding a small white envelope in his left hand. Next to him stood Lisa Bloom, the student council president. She was holding the queen's crown and scepter. And now, said the principal, this year's winner and Shady Side's prom queen. He ripped open the envelope. All the kids at the prom had stopped dancing and were watching the prom queens. Mr. Seawall, too. What he saw was so horrifying that he never announced the winner. One by one, the prom queen slowly turned to face the audience. As each girl turned, screams rang out through the auditorium. Each face was revealed. Each face greeted the screens with blank and staring eyes. The flesh in the girls' faces was decaying. Their hair was matted with wet dirt and dead brown leaves. Their faces looked as if they'd been buried in wet earth for several weeks. Bone poked through with the putrid, sagging chunks of greenish flesh. Simone's face was the most frightening. The flesh of her cheeks had rotted so badly that her cheekbones were sticking right through. Only the eyes of the prom queens remained intact. The girls' eyes were all blood red. They stared at the audience with unblinking fury, ghoulish faces, in beautiful gowns. The five prom queens stepped toward the audience, staggering forward stiffly, closer, closer, until the smell of rotting flesh choked everyone in the gym. The girls all raised their heads in silent, hideous laughter. And as they raised their heads, their blood-red eyes flaring, their necks were revealed. Their necks, their shoulders were covered with slithering white worms. I woke up screaming. I screamed so loud I also woke up my parents and my Aunt Rena. All three of them came bursting into my bedroom, their still sleep-filled faces tense with alarm. Sweetheart, my mother said, plopping down on the side of my bed, you almost gave me a heart attack. Bad dreams are just bad dreams, my father said, patting me on the head. He'd been saying the same thing to me since I was four. I didn't mind. If I ever had kids of my own, I'll probably tell them the exact same thing. If only the nightmares would go away. If only I could sleep one night without being reminded of my lost friends. My parents and my aunt went quickly back to their rooms. I stared up at the ceiling, trying to erase the warm, covered prom queens from my memory. The next day at assembly, I'd have to give my speech for prom queen. 
I forced myself to go over in my mind what I had worked out to say. I was going to talk about Rachel and Simone. The two people you should vote for aren't here today, I planned to start, Rachel West and Simone Perry. But as soon as I said their names, I saw their faces. Not the way they had actually been, but the way they were in my dream. Just a dream, Lizzie, I told myself once more. Just a dream. Wipe it away. Away. Of course, this one time my dad was wrong. This one time a bad dream was not just a bad dream. This time the dream was real. Chapter 17 Yuck, what's that? I asked. I was staring into a steam table container of baked muck. I could make out yellow kernels of corn, old spaghetti, mashed potatoes that had gotten stiff, greasy hamburger meat, pale green peas, and a little of every other awful meat the school had served us during the week. It's shepherd's pie, Mrs. Liston, the cafeteria worker, told me with a blank face. Looks more like something the shepherd stepped in, cracked a familiar male voice in my ear. It was Lucas. I pushed my tray along without answering. I wasn't really hungry, at least not for shepherd's pie. Lucas hurried to catch up. Steam rose from the large glob of shepherd's pie on his plate. Go on, he said. Take a taste. Lucas, for the last time, bug off. Or else, he said with that little smirk of his. Or else we'll end up looking like shepherd's pie, I said. There, I thought. My insults are getting better. I paid for my container of yogurt and salad and headed for an empty table. Alana waved to me. She was sitting with Dawn. I nodded back but kept going. I didn't feel like sitting with them right then. The prom was only eight days away, and there we'd be, the three remaining prom queen candidates, all sitting at a row at the table like ducks in a shooting gallery, just waiting for some maniac out there to take a shot. I found a seat across from some nerdy-looking freshman. He looked stunned when I sat down. Anyone sitting here? I asked. He was unable to answer. TGIF, right? I said, digging into my salad. Yeah, he said. He glanced down the long table. There were a bunch of seniors staring our way. When I looked back at my lunch date, he was puffing out his chest and smiling proudly. For ten straight minutes, he slurped on an empty carton of chocolate milk and told me how much he hated Jim. I'd like to kill that Jim teacher, he confided in me. I sighed. Even the freshmen were killers. Thanks for avoiding us, a voice said as I was finishing the last of my yogurt. I looked up. It was Alana, her face drawn, tight, and tense. I guess she was feeling the same pressure I was. I stood up and said goodbye to the kid across from me. Yeah, see you tomorrow, he said. I had made a friend for life. Ilana wasn't smiling. Can we talk, was all she said. We had about twenty minutes left in lunch period. We decided to take a walk. Outside it was a pretty spring day. Thanks to all the rain, everything was lush and green. There were birds chirping, insects buzzing. You could feel everything beginning to come to life. We headed for Shadyside Park, behind the school. Neither of us said much of anything. We sat on a recently painted park bench. You ready for the assembly today? I asked, trying to get things rolling. To tell you the truth, Alana said, I've had so much in my mind, I hadn't really thought about it. It's like I don't even care about it anymore. I nodded and waited for her to go on. Finally, Alana said, I just feel so terrible, and then she fell silent again. I looked at Alana. She was wearing a long blue and white sweater over blue leggings and a gold band necklace that I was sure was real. She had her hair tied in a cute little ponytail with a white scrunchie. On her cheeks I could detect just a trace of apricot blush. She may have been feeling terrible, but she wasn't feeling so bad that she had stopped paying attention to how she looked. Such cruel thoughts. I scolded myself for being so harsh. Alana did look glum. I just feel so guilty, she said, sighing. Why? Alana stared at me, as if she didn't believe that I didn't know. For going out with Gideon, she said. For breaking him and Rachel up. I avoided her eyes. I happened to think that it was really awful of her, but I didn't want to say so now. It wasn't my idea, you know, she told me. Gideon kept after me and after me, said he really liked me and that he and Rachel were just meant to be friends. She stared at me again. Obviously, she wanted me to say it was all right. I tried, but I couldn't force the words out. I never got to apologize to her before she died, she continued. I, I just feel so bad about it. I think about it all the time. Her eyes were getting moist. I had never seen Alana cry before. I suddenly felt sorry for her. I put my arm around her shoulder. Hey, I said, what happened to Rachel was not your fault. Stop thinking that way, Alana. We've got enough to feel bad about without blaming ourselves. 
Alana gave me a grateful smile and swiped at her nose with the back of her hand. Thanks, she whispered. By the way, has Gideon ever said anything to you about the prom queen contest? I asked her. She looked surprised. No, maybe. Why? I was just curious. His family is about as poor as Rachel's, you know. So? I was trying to decide whether it was worth scaring her with my crazy suspicions. I'm glad we decided to go ahead with it, Alana said. Mr. Seawall had called us in that morning, me, Alana, and Dawn, to see if we felt up to continuing the contest. Dawn had said that Simone and Rachel wouldn't have wanted us to quit, and Alana and I both agreed. You have a dress yet? Alana asked me, her eyes on a large robin, pulling a worm from the ground. No. Last night my parents told me I have to be home by eleven after the prom. Eleven? I know, she shook her head. Some prom. It's not turning out the way we thought, I agreed. Tracy Simon dropped out of the Halsey Manor Decorating Committee because she was scared to go out to the Fear Street Woods. I don't blame her, I said. I'm not looking forward to it myself. Alana stared at her hands. Do you agree with Dawn? She asked quietly. About what? That someone's trying to kill all the prom queens? I bit my lip nervously. I don't know. Maybe. Alana's face went blank. When she was scared, she just shut down. She smiled abruptly, a big forced smile, and stretched. You know who I'm going with? Bruce Chadwin. I knew she was desperately trying to change the subject, and she was succeeding. I gaped at her. Bruce? Did he ask you? Uh-huh. Dawn will kill you, I blushed. I mean, she'll be mad. I know, she shrugged. I always seem to be getting some girl angry at me. But what could I do? He asked me, not her. And it's not like she doesn't have a big choice of dates. And speaking of dates... Kevin's father still won't let him come, I said. I'll probably wind up going with my cousin Seth, the one from Waynesbridge. He said he'd do me a favor and take me. Is that the worst? But that's not my biggest problem. I'm really worried about my speech this afternoon. Do you think you could help me? I'm completely terrified of public speaking. It's true. I am. In fact, I once read about a survey that showed that public speaking frightens some people more than death. I wouldn't go that far, but I do get really nervous. I worried about it all afternoon, but the speeches went fine. We each got huge rounds of applause, and when Alana finished talking about why we had decided to go on, the three of us all got a standing ovation. I drove home right after school. I had an early dinner with my folks and Aunt Rena. Then I headed back to school for play rehearsal. I wanted to get there early. Every time I tried to lower the flats for the captain's mansion, the back wall would stick about halfway down. With only a week to go, Robbie was beginning to lose his sense of humor. I didn't need him screaming at me right then, so I wanted to get the problem solved before he showed up. When I arrived, there were only a few cars in the parking lot. The school hallways were empty, quiet. Whenever I passed an open locker, I banged it shut. I felt like making a lot of noise. I breathed deeply. I knew that old school smell so well, a combination of floor wax, sweat, peanut butter, and sour milk. How could anything bad happen here? Then I turned the corner and nearly bumped into Mr. Santucci, who was mopping the floor. Trying to scare me again, eh? he said. He didn't smile when he said it. The auditorium was nearly pitch dark. Who had pulled the heavy curtain shut to darken all the windows? It must have been Santucci. I made my way up the center aisle. It was the same trip I had made early that afternoon to give my speech. But then the room had been packed, bright and noisy. Now I got an eerie feeling, and suddenly I felt as if I wasn't alone. I walked up the steps to the stage. The act curtain was closed, so I felt my way along it into the wings. I walked slowly. There was plenty to trip on in the wings. Ropes, props, lights. That would just be my luck. A crazed murderer is stalking me, but I managed to avoid him. Then I trip and break my neck all by myself. I found the master light board, felt the large wooden handles. I pulled down the first one and heard the huge bank of lights come on with a loud hum. I pulled down all the handles one by one. I knew the lights were bathing the stage in warm color. Then I turned around and started to scream. Chapter 18 Still screaming at the top of my lungs, I rushed onto the stage. I couldn't stop. My cries echoed off the walls of the vast auditorium. As I approached center stage, the hideous scene became all too clear. Alana lay face down in the middle of the stage. Her left arm bent beneath her in a way an arm does not bend. The fingers of her right hand were stretched wide, as if she'd been clawing at the stage. Dark red blood had splattered several feet across the stage floor. I kept screaming. 
Finally, the auditorium doors burst open and Mr. Santucci charged in, still carrying his mop. Get an ambulance, I screamed at him. He stared up at me, confused. I charged to the edge of the stage. Get an ambulance, now! He dropped the mop, turned, and ran. I was still on stage, huddled near Alana's lifeless body, when the emergency medical workers finally arrived a few minutes later. Two police officers bounded into the auditorium behind them. I watched them all race toward me up the center aisle. I could hear their walkie-talkies crackling. By then I knew there was no reason for them to rush. Oh no, said a woman in a white medical suit, the first to reach me. What happened? barked a tall, red-haired cop as he came up the stairs. Two paramedics gingerly turned Alana right side up. I nearly fainted. Her face was smashed and bloody. It looked like her face in my nightmare. The first medic felt for a pulse in Alana's neck. Then he made eye contact with the rest of us. His face was pale. He shook his head sadly. Looks like she fell, one of the police officers said, staring up into the fly space. She looked down at me. I recognized her. It was Officer Barnett. Were you here? Did you see what happened? She asked me. No. The red-haired cop pointed up to the catwalk. She could have fallen off that. Officer Barnett leaned down and put a hand on my shoulder. Any idea why she would have been up there? I raised my eyes. There's a little prop room up there, I told her. I'm up there sometimes. She could have been looking for me. Officer Barnett started climbing up to the prop room to take a look around. I stayed down below and answered more questions from the policemen. They were loading Alana's body onto a stretcher. I don't know why they were taking her to the hospital, but I guess they did that even if you were dead. She didn't fall, I told the cop quietly. That much I know for sure. What makes you say that? I have no proof, I realized. It seems so obvious to me, though. I just know it, I said stupidly. And that was when I saw it. It was clutched in Alana's hand, the hand that had looked as if it were clawing the floor. Her hand was clutching a small swatch of maroon satin. And you say she seems nervous, Officer Jackson asked. Yeah, but why wouldn't she be? I said, I'm nervous. Dawn's nervous. We're all scared out of our minds. My dad's arm tightened around my shoulder. He was sitting on one side of me on our white corduroy sofa. Dawn was on the other. Officer Jackson and Officer Barnett were sitting across from us. Officer Barnett was taking notes. It was after ten, and these questions had been going on for over an hour. It seemed as if I had spent the whole spring talking to the police. Officer Jackson said, But did she seem extra nervous? I sighed loudly. Yes! I was letting my exasperation show. Wouldn't you be? I can't even sleep at night. Someone's killing off the prom queen, snaps Dawn. It's so obvious. Dawn had already told them her theory. Officer Jackson stared her down. We're pursuing every lead, was all he said. I mean, Dawn continued, I was excited when we were first nominated. Now it looks like we've been nominated to, to die. Can't you see that? Officer Jackson's frown deepened. If you just answer a few more questions, then we'll be through. Officer Barnett stood up. I'm sorry, Lizzie. This won't take much longer. But you were the last person to see both Rachel and Alana alive. We're trying to find out everything we can. She turned to Dawn. Before rehearsal, you were... Playing tennis, Dawn said. And the last time you saw Alana was at the assembly? Right! Officer Barnett turned back to me. Let's go over the part about the baseball jacket one more time. I told her everything I knew. For the nine zillionth time, I talked about the man I saw running into the woods, his maroon satin jacket. I'm telling you, I really think it's Lucas, I added. Officer Jackson snapped his notebook shut and stood up. We're going to talk to him next. So, who do you think did it? Dawn asked. We're following up every lead, Officer Jackson said. Dawn and I stared at each other. Why can't you at least tell us who your suspects are? Dawn asked, her voice rising. I mean... Don't you think we'd be safer if we at least knew who to watch for? Officer Jackson shrugged. Just take every precaution you can, he advised. I'm afraid that's all I can tell you right now. Dad walked the police to the door. Dawn stood up, stretched, and shivered. Well, I guess I'll go home too, she said. What are you going to do? I asked. Oh, nothing. Barricade my door. Load my machine gun. The usual. She gave me a little smile. I tried to smile back, but I couldn't. It's just us now, Dawn said. What do you mean? For prom queen. I looked at her to see if she was serious. She was. You're still not thinking about the contest, are you? Three murders aren't enough to get you to stop worrying about who's going to win? 
Don shrugged. Well, you win, I said. I resign. I'm going to tell Mr. Seawall tomorrow. I quit. I don't want to be prom queen, believe me. Where are they going to hold the prom anyway? The shady side funeral parlor? I spun around dramatically. I meant to make that my exit line, but I bumped right into my mom. Hey, take it easy, she told me. I walked past her and up the stairs without saying a word. I went to my room and slammed the door, but I wasn't as angry as I hoped I'd be. I probably wanted to take it all out on Dawn. I couldn't. I heard the front door close. I peered out the window into the darkness. I could make out Dawn, moving down the shadowy front walkway. She looked so vulnerable. I felt bad that I had gotten so angry. I watched until I saw her car pull safely on its way. Then I watched for a while longer. I watched the trees swaying in the wind. I listened to the leaves rustle. If someone wasn't out there, there were plenty of places for him to hide. It wasn't until I sat on the bed that I realized my legs were trembling. I could actually see them shake. I felt shaky all over. My chest felt all feathery. I lay down, trying to calm down. I'm next, I thought. It was a terrifying thought, but I couldn't stop myself. The words kept running through my mind. I'm next. I'm next. I'm next. And then Lucas's words. I like you. I really like you. I was still lying there twenty minutes later, my eyes wide open, one scary thought chasing another through my brain. And then the phone on the bed table rang shrilly in my ear. I stared at it, listening to it ring. I didn't want to pick it up. Chapter 19 Hello? Lizzie? Yeah? It's Justin. Oh, hi. Hi. What's up? Uh, well, I, uh... He sounded nervous. Why would Justin be so nervous? What's the matter? I asked. Nothing, nothing. Can I, uh, come over? Come over? Yeah. Now? Well, uh, yeah. Justin, it's almost eleven. My folks have already gone to bed. Yeah, well, it's really important. What is it? Are you okay? I'm fine. I'm fine. Can't you tell me what it is? No, he said. I'll tell you in person. Okay? Why did he sound so strange? Okay, he said again. Yeah, I guess. I couldn't think straight. Something was going on, but I wasn't sure what it was. Good. I'll be there in about fifteen minutes. I won't ring the doorbell, though. I, uh, don't want to wake your parents, so just wait downstairs, okay? Okay. And then I thought of something else. Justin? Yeah? We can't. My dad puts on the burglar alarm at night. I can't go downstairs. Tied security, huh? That's right. Well, he said, turn the alarm off. Then I heard the click as he hung up the phone. The master alarm panel is on the landing outside my parents' bedroom. I could see the light under their door, but I didn't really hear any voices. The light was shining under the guest room, too, so my Aunt Rena was also up. Hanging from the doorknob of my parents' door, my mom's cardboard sign read, Alarm On. I quietly punched in our security code. The red LCD light blinked twice, then faded out. I flipped the cardboard sign over so that it read, Alarm Off. Then I tiptoed downstairs to wait. About twenty minutes later, Justin's face appeared in the front window. He was wearing a maroon Shadyside High baseball cap. He pointed to the front door, and I went and let him in. Hey, he whispered when I opened the door. He gave me a funny grin. Come on in. We can talk in here. I led the way into the den and closed the door. He leaned against my dad's desk and shoved his fingertips into the front pockets of his jeans. He crossed his legs, uncrossed them. Then he took his hands out of his pockets. He seemed really uncomfortable. So, he said quietly, you talk to the cops? For hours. Listen, you don't have to whisper or anything. My parents are upstairs. Great, he said, too loudly. What was his problem? He was usually so laid back, so smooth. Now he was staring at me intensely. His forehead was all sweaty. These are pretty scary times, he said. You must be scared, right? You bet I am. Is this what he came over to talk to me about? I looked down at his hands. So did he. He was holding my dad's silver letter opener, the one with the curved handle and a dagger-sharp point. He started to pace, slapping his palm with a knife. So, he said, what exactly did you tell the police? Everything I could think of, I couldn't take my eyes off the knife. I told them. I stopped myself mid-sentence. What? I didn't want to say. What, Lizzie? He went on, his eyes boring into mine. What did you tell them? 
What I was about to say was that I told the cops about the strip of maroon satin in Alana's hand. But instead, I said, what do you care? He laughed a crazy laugh. You're right. I don't care a bit. I wasn't looking at the letter opener anymore. I was looking at Justin's baseball cap. Sewn onto the front was a tiger's emblem. Why hadn't it occurred to me before now? Justin was on the baseball team, too. Not just Lucas. Justin was all state, one of the team's stars. So Justin also had a maroon satin jacket. Why are you standing so far away? Justin asked me, smiling awkwardly. Think I'm going to bite you? No, I... Come over here, then. My mind had started to race. I'm happy over here, I said. But Justin had started to walk slowly toward me. The letter opener held tightly in his hand.